We've got the Heiko Aurora 1000 tower speakers. That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene DeLaSalle with Audioholics. We got James Larson back in the house. He just finished his review of the Heiko Aurora 1000 speakers. That's what we want to talk about, James. You gave these a very favorable review. You're not a type of person that glows in, over new products. But the comments in the, vi in the review online on audioholics.com, and I'll link it up in the video below, they were very favorable. And you were quite impressed with this product. And the great thing about it is they are not super expensive. I think the Heiko, um, the Aurora 1000s are what, $800 each? Yeah, $1,600 a pair. So they're not hugely expensive. I mean, it's, they're not giving them away, but they're not super expensive. They're not going to break the bank for most people. So, yeah. so let's talk about, here it is right here, the Heiko Aurora 1000, $799 each. The only way you can get these speakers is through our channel partner, Audio Advice. They're the main distributor in the United States. It's a German company. So these are German engineered products and they've had quite a heritage. They've been around for decades. It's not like they just popped up overnight. This is a company that has its roots in audio for several decades. Yeah, um, they were a manufacturer back, I think back going to the fifties, but like a big box store manufacturer for, um, or, you know, in Germany from like the fifties to the eighties. And if you look them up, you can find older speakers of theirs. I think they kind of like, I don't know if they just kind of ceased operations for a little while, or if they just couldn't find examples of the work from like the nineties, two thousands. But I think, I think that the brand was brought back by, uh, like, I think they're owned by magnet magnate is what mm -hmm. that, that German company, right? Yep. And now they're being distributed by um, uh, audio advice, uh, audio advice is it advice or advisor, <laughs> audio advice. And audio I'll put advice. some links. I'll put links in the description below. If anybody's interested in purchasing these, this, they have several models of towers. They have the 700, the 800, and the, I think the 1000 is their flagship in the series. Correct. Yeah. The 1000 of the big, big guys in uh, this lineup, the Aurora series. And, and you uh, can see, guys, he's got it right behind him. Uh, this is in a white finish. Yeah, it's the, it comes in white and black, and the siding is like some like a imitation kind of wood vinyl. But the front baffle on the top is white, so like it's there's a basically a bright color and a dark color, and so like whatever you want for your decor, they have something that can you kind of get a better look at it there in our slideshow. Yeah, so why don't we go through the slide presentation here? And guys, if you're a patron, uh, the slide presentation is available on our Patreon channel, so please check it out there. But I'm just going to go through this quickly with you, James, and you can give us a rundown of the speaker. Sure. I mean, the people. I mean, if you want a more in-depth presentation, just go online and look at the written review. Um, Absolutely, it'll be linked up in the description below. So, I mean, if you couldn't tell just by looking at this speaker, this is a three-way speaker. Uses a 1.0 inch dome. Uh, the base drivers are two 7.9 inch uh, paper cones and the mid range is a 6.7 inch paper cone. So that's a pretty big um, mid range. And that's a lot of like surface area overall yeah. for, for a speaker, especially at this price point. So like um, it's, it does have the dynamic range, you know, with that, that sort of uh, like firepower, you know? You know, it's a European speaker when it has obscurely sized woofers. It's not like a six and a half. It's not an eight inch. It's 7.9 and 6.7. Well, I mean, it that makes more sense than like metric. <laughs> Those are yeah, probably yeah. better metrics. But like you know, we're more of an American kind of based website, so you know, and this is more for audio advice. So we were quoting them in the English system. Interesting that they they have pretty high sensitivity for a non horn loaded speaker, ninety three dB. That's quite good. Um, they're of substantial size, 47 inches. How much do they weigh? Do they weigh about 50 pounds a piece, 60 pounds a piece? It doesn't I think it was like 60. I think okay. there was so it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty hefty little speaker there. Well, not little, um, but it's actually not pretty little, big speaker. Yeah. And it doesn't weigh as much as like 60 pounds isn't terrible for a tower speaker. Or you can see it with the um, grills on and off. Um, yeah, it looks fine. I mean, I think it looks 
the the, the like the it has this vinyl kind of like finish. It looks okay at a distance, but if you go get up close to it, you can tell pretty easily it's not quite. It's not really like like that convincing as a wood finish, right? I think maybe they could have found a better like imitation wood. Like well, green. we got to keep in mind the price and yeah. the fact that they're trying to stuff a lot of performance into a speaker that's a tower that's only eight hundred dollars each, and that's coming from you know overseas. That's not um, you know a local speaker as well. So I, I was like, yeah, my I, my I thought like, I didn't know anything about Heiko anything when I got these speakers. Right? They asked me to review them, and I thought like I so like I saw like the it was like the the vinyl like finish was a little cheesy and like i never heard of Heiko. i didn't know anything about it and paper cones are you are like you know you see them on like cheaper um speakers so I, I didn't i thought when i first unpacked these i assumed that well maybe this might not be the greatest speaker right but i was surprised i was surprised but let's let's go through our slideshow it actually turned out to be way better than like my first impression upon unpacking them yeah, you can't judge a book by its cover. So the interesting thing that tweeter, it's it looks like a shallow waveguide, but then it's kind of uh, you know way kind of rigid with those yeah. rings around it. Like, what's that all? Is that more decorative, or do you think there's a function to that? They call that the fluctus tweeter. I think that has more to do with the uh, this. They call it a waveguide, but this is not like any waveguide I've ever seen, right? And I, you know, um, I thought it might be to uh, play with the um diffraction the the front panel the front baffle diffraction to kind of spread that those like modes around the diffraction modes right so that they're not there's like one sharp or or several sharp frequencies that just it's there to mitigate diffraction i don't know i don't really know the theory behind them but they call it the fluctus tweeter right and, right. It's a, and they call it a waveguide and i don't know the it measures well so like i mean it might work i don't know i don't know anything you know, about it but it, it, you know what's interesting though is usually when you deal with a budget speaker like this they they tend to give you like a little neodymium slug for the magnet this actually has a pretty substantial ferrite magnet and they put a bucking magnet on the back of it which in close inspection you're like why would you have that in this day and age nobody has a crt tv but the fact that they didn't put a can around it may imply that they put that extra magnet to increase the bl of the driver itself wouldn't you say that that's probably why it's there Yes, I mean some people do it to increase the sensitivity. I mean, you know, increasing the 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 magnetic field around the gap or like containing it or something. Um, yeah, I, it, I don't. There's no CRTs around anymore, so I, I think that might be it. Just it just seems a, like a pretty substantial driver and, and an eight hundred dollar each speaker. Yeah, it's it's not it's not terrible. Um, here and then here's another thing. They have another bucking magnet on it. This is the mid range uh, woofer. It's, oh, know, I thought that was comes. the base driver. Wow. No, that's it's the mid range, and it has a buck, a big bucking magnet on it as well. And I guess it might be to like direct the magnetic field strength to the gap or something. Uh -huh. um, because, like you said, where the <laughs> normally they're 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 used to be used to contain the magnetic field, so they don't interfere with CRT televisions. But that also can increase the magnetic strength of the um, you know the flux in the gap. So I guess that's why they're doing this. Anyways, what do you think the voice coil size in those drivers? Do you think it's an inch and a half voice coil? You know, I measured it, but I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't expecting that question. There, was yeah, kind of I, was that's, I mean, it looks like a pretty like it has a high power handling. It's got those little slots in the basket itself. I guess that's for uh, cooling the voice coil. Yeah, I mean, it has to be cooled somewhere. Um, normally, speakers will cool it either under the spider like that or through yeah. the, the pole piece. Sometimes, but seldom, they'll do it both. Um, does both does this have a vented pole piece or no? Man, I don't remember again. I don't think it does. <laughs> those are, those are, yeah, it yeah, doesn't look I, like it does. I don't think so, but I don't remember. I don't think it does, though. So, yeah, it's not a bad um, woofer. Um, here's the 8-inch, or we'll just round it up to 8-inch base drivers. You yeah, know? you see, I don't see a vented pole piece on the back of that. Yeah, I think they're basically the same. That The mid-range is a lot like the base drivers here, so... And well, as we'll see later, the the mid range actually runs really wide band, well into the bass frequencies. Now, didn't they say that the cone is made out of a recycled material or something? Yeah, something like that. But like, it's such a small mi amount of material that it's not really. Who cares if it's recycled? I mean, it's everything else isn't. So like, um, it's not really that. There's not like an echo friendly speaker any more than any other speaker is. Yeah, I gotcha. Me. 
But um, it's still a marketing point, I guess. It's, it's a marketing good. point, and they're fine. They work. The woofers work well, so I'm not complaining. You know, I like the, I like that they have their brand on the basket of the of the frame of the driver. It says Heco on it. That's a pretty nice touch. Yeah, it, I mean, it does. Yeah, it, it does do that. I mean, I think these drivers are made by I don't know whatever factory they they work with. Here's wow, the, they uh, actually are these bi ampable or just bi wireable? They're they're bi ampable. Um. Yeah, you well, can buy up them if you really want. I don't think there's really a great the, the the power handling for me. It doesn't quite justify doing that, you know. So like, I wouldn't, but you could, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, they, they do handle like I think 250 watts, right? So I mean, maybe you could if you weren't happy with the. If you wanted just a few dB more of headroom than what your like AVR has given you, so I guess you could buy up them in that case, you know. And and the the, the crossover standard, it's it's. It's fine for you know what you'd expect at its price. It's not better or worse. I mean, it's got eleven or twelve elements on it. Usually, you get really cheesy crossovers at for budget towers. So, yeah, it's just not, not really a budget tower, but it's not a super expensive one. I think the crossover fits the what you'd expect to find. But I think the the what it impresses me about this speaker is what it does with these components. It's not the components. So nothing in this speaker is like super fancy. No, it's yeah, the some of the parts equal more than than the. You know, the that's product. exactly right. Yeah. There's nothing in this speaker that's like super, you know, that is an especially impressive, but it's the way everything comes together. Well, wow, it's a nice, those are nice, um, vents in the back. Yeah. Again, I, a little cheesy. Those look like they might be metal, but it's painted to look like metal as is the, the plate, the, uh, binding post plate, right? Yeah, it's actually it plastic. Nice though. Yeah, I mean, on close inspection, though, it's it's obviously not what it looks like from like kind of a distance. But again, it's it looks fine, you know, and it, it's what it does. It, it's impressive. It's not what it's like pretending to be. Well, let me ask you because it's flared like that. I'm assuming it's flared on both ends. I I, I believe so. You um, didn't hear yeah. any port chuffing when you were hitting it with bass, right? I mean, you know what the thing about speakers is if the, the the port is not facing you, it's hard to hear port chuffing. Yeah, because it acts as a low pass filter. Yeah, it's like I, I mean maybe there's port chuffing, but I didn't hear it. And since it's oh, rear mounted, it doesn't matter as much. So yeah. Right. That looks pretty good. Yeah, there's just the packing. Okay, yeah. Now we're getting into the measurements. Um, the, uh, there's those. Uh, that's obviously the conditions I was measuring it in. Like so, nice... guys. Just so you know, every speaker that James Larson reviews for Audioholics, he puts it through the same test procedure. He measures it outdoors because it takes away the influence of the room. And what you're left with is what the speaker itself is doing. And he measures it around the speaker, you know, around the horizontal plane, and and to somewhat extend some vertical. And he measures it down to I think what 100 or 200 hertz. To get yep. it accurate, and then he does he does ground plane measurements for the base, so you know where the three dB point is on the base. So our test procedure is very consistent. It takes the room out of the equation, and every speaker is measured pretty much in a similar fashion, so everything is fair. Yeah, I mean that's exactly right. Everything is all the measurements I do are comparable with each other. I mean, but more so within the, the certain speaker type. So like all the tower measurements that I do, they're basically two meters, the mic is two meters away, always aimed at the tweeter, unless there's some reason I have not to aim it at the tweeter, but most, you know, almost always the tweeter, right? And mm -hmm. the speaker is always up there, like on this like about five foot stand, right? And I get good resolution down to like 200 Hertz, you know? Like and the, po the point of measuring at two meters is that way all the drivers are acoustically summed because you, some people can make the mistake of measuring a large tower like that too close and then you don't get proper summation and you think there's a problem with the product when there isn't. That's exactly right. Uh, sometimes I'll measure a little bit closer if I know that the drivers are summing up um, at a closer distance, but... Um, but like you, you have to be sure that the drivers are summing at that distance. You know, exactly. The, clo the closer you can get to the speaker, the better the measurements um, that you can get from it, as long as the drivers cohere. You know. Yep. So, so we're looking at a 3D plot here of, of horizontal frequency response. Why don't you explain why you're showing that? It's basically. Uh, I mean, I don't want to talk for you. It's your measurement. <laughs> you talk <laughs> about all the angles. Uh, well, okay. This is like the the frequency response across all the angles out to uh, 90 degrees. Um, and we, I show this view. Normally, people show this like on like a 2D like a profile view of the frequency response. But the, I want to kind of give you an idea of the overall like um, 
uh, what I want to say, ca character or like curvature or, or the nature of the the way that the, all the um, responses relate to each other, the off and on actress response relate to each other, right? So you yep. can know where where the speaker is like flatter, where it might, you know, how the nature of the roll off at the, the top end or the nature of any kind of resonances or anything like that. So we, I always have the 3D graph there. And, and what I see is a very smooth um, response here, all the way out to you know around ten kilohertz before it starts beaming at the freq at the high frequencies. But I mean that's pretty typical of a dome tweeter uh, speaker like that. Yeah, this is a really this is a very good measurement set. Everything is very consistent. There's a few little ripples, right? But that's not. There's like a couple dBs, almost unaudible, you know. And across yeah. like the entire like mid range band, it's really nice and um, consistent across you know. Very flat on axis and nicely, um, nicely corresponding off axis. So it's a good measurement set. Everything is nice and smooth. Yeah, it looks really good. So th this is a kind of a straight out, straight like ahead a profile view. view. Yeah, it's profile like, view. Yeah, this, like, and this gives you like a better look at the lines individually, and uh -huh. so you can see like um what exactly they're doing if you can kind of like follow. So the there's angle. there's a little bit of a rise above 10k, but on axis, I mean. Um, yeah, it's basically on axis and five degrees, you know, and like. It's, but look it's, how smooth it is off axis. So you could really, you could put these speakers straight ahead and and they'd sit be neutral. between them, right? Yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah. I, I listen to them with them aimed straight at me and they're just neutral speakers. So there's a blip at, uh, just above, say, I don't know, what, 14 kilohertz, right? Yeah. Most very people, few people are going to hear that. Hear it yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like it's it's a it's a very accurate speaker, especially considering the price. You know, so that like, is very I, impressive. Yeah, I I didn't know what to expect, and when I saw that, I was like, wow, this thing is a, that's really good, right? So uh, now this is how the predator sees the measurements, right? Kind of. If the predator were looking straight above, this is more like a bird's eye view of the previous measurements, where we look at um everything like where, where the amplitude is um basically. A hotter color, right? And this shows us the broader trends of the off-axis response, so we can see where the speaker kind of like um, narrows its dispersion, right? And where, do, where, how far out does it carry its like a uh, its full response? So, and this tells us that you can get all the way up to like 15 kilohertz. You're going to get a very strong response, you know, losing hardly anything compared to the off-axis. I mean, compared to the on-axis response, and you could listen to this. I mean, you have a really strong response out to, I would say, 50 degrees out to 10 kilohertz. So it, this this tells you that this speaker has a broad, a broad dispersion and it covers a wide area. Um, and um, it, it's, a, it's just a broad, dis very wide dispersion loudspeaker. So like, it's 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 good. I mean, and like, I guess some people might prefer a narrower dispersion loudspeaker, but it, it just shows you that this the dispersion is consistent. The directivity is very good, and it doesn't even start beaming until way above 10 kilohertz. And you know, Gene, most dome tweeters don't, they, they start to beam a little bit below that point, especially. Yeah, like, I know. That's this, guys, this is a really good measurement. This is something to be proud of if you're a Haco owner or you're thinking about getting a speaker that's under two grand a pair. This is some solid performance right here. Yeah, that's excellent. And here's uh, the ground plane uh, response of the low frequencies. You know, you get a nicely flat response all the way down to like i want to say 70 or 60 hertz right then we have a kind of a i you might call it a second order roll off almost what you'd see of a more like a sealed sub you know but yeah. the, the port is active the port is actually like kind of like supplementing the, the 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 response down in the low frequencies but what i think is happening here is the port isn't really giving them more output at a low frequency rather it's just controlling the woofer right so if you had a sealed speaker the woofer would be just moving like crazy down on the low frequencies well if you port it the the woofer it, it starts the movement of the woofer starts being heavily restricted as you get down to port tuning the port tuning frequency and it's it's a really clean base you know so you can do this you can exchange you can just kind of like under uh tune the sub for like just really low distortion base but it, it does cost you some, you know, headroom in the low frequencies. But so, so you're sacrificing some some low extension in a speaker like this, but you're gaining a lot more output. You're not going to be able to easily overdrive the woofers or bottom out the woofers. 
Um, there's a lot of speakers I've measured over the years, especially bookshelf speakers that tune them really low, 40 or 50 Hertz. And then as soon as when you turn it above 70, 75 DB, uh, bass intense music, you bottom the hell out of the woofers. Just by looking at the way they tune this, I don't think it's an easy speaker to do that to. No, I mean, the, the porting on this speaker, I think, I, I haven't talked to the engineers, but I think it's just to control woofer movement. It's not to give it the typical headroom inc improvement that you get with normal speaker porting, right? Mm -hmm. So that you just get really clean bass. And also the, the nature of the roll-off is that the room game will really shore that up is because because it's a really shallow roll-off and you still have usable bass down to a low frequency, right? Although, yeah. So it's not a flat response to a low frequency, but it's a, a, you get clean deep bass at a low frequency and like it, the room game will take care of the rest you know it's like it's does Heiko does Heiko make subwoofers yeah they do um I don't know much about the sub oh okay it's so maybe we like, should look at that to see if it would be a good pairing with a speaker like this you know yeah well we could talk to audio advice and see if they want to send us a sub okay here all right this is just kind of a goof I did this slide okay this shows us like um Okay, I ported one of the, 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 the I mean, I sealed one of the you, ports, you right? You sealed one, yeah. Because the speaker is actually tuned to a pretty low frequency, right? Just to control the woofer motion, right? I think the, the tuning frequency of the speaker with both ports open, I mean, which is how it's supposed to be run, is 30 hertz, right? Yeah. But if you plug a port, that that brings down the tuning frequency down to like 22 hertz or so. Yeah, but you lose like 4 dB, 5 dB of sensitivity. Yeah, you lose output, but you gain extension. So I think, but this might be useful if you're like in a small room and you really don't want a subwoofer, right? Mm. This will give you more deep bass. If you don't really crank the speaker hard, right? This will give you just plugging a, a port, just making an, air, uh, making an airtight seal and just one of the ports will give you more deep bass. But uh, this is not how they recommend or intend the speaker to be used. Yeah, uh, you know what? I would probably do a shelving filter with EQ instead of maybe doing that, to be honest. Well, this, with you. That, that, that doesn't get you any more bass. This actually gets you more headroom. But, but it, you know, it's not very useful unless you're in a small room. But yeah. I just, this is just something you could do. And I did to see what happened. So to show people what they could do if they have one of these speakers. Yeah, and, and okay. here's what here's okay. This is the impedance curve of just the. So the uh, green is what you would normally use, use the speaker as. Yeah, the green is what you normally use the speakers, and this is just showing you how the um imp the tuning frequency of the ports change if you actually plug with the port. So that so each uh, like curve shows a saddle shape, right? And then more the, symmetric with both ports open. Yeah, it is more symmetric. It's better. You should use it with both ports open. So this is again kind of like showing you what happens. The tuning frequency uh, of the speaker that's supposed to be run with both ports open is you can see the nadir of this, the, the minima of the saddle is like 30 hertz. But if you plug the port and it, it shoves that tuning frequency down to like, uh, I don't know, just above 20 hertz. So I mean, so you yeah. can get deeper bass if you plug a port. But that's not normally how the speaker should be run. But if you have a small room, you could probably, it might be worth investigating how it sounds. So if any of you guys own these speakers, the Heiko Aurora 1000s, again, they're $7.99 each, available at Audio Advice. If you own the speaker, tell us down below if you've tried uh, sealing one of the ports and what your experience was with yeah. the levels. Get some users that are actually uh, owners of this speaker to see what their response is on that. All right, so now we're looking at the entire impedance plot, and this can tell you more than just the impedance. It actually tells you if there's any uh, issues with the cabinet resonances, as you're showing here. Yeah, I mean, I, okay, I, here's a measurement we took, and I thought, well, the cabinet is not the most overbuilt cabinet, right? I mean, it's you could tell they cut the costs on like, like the enclosure, you know, like uh, some enclosures have like three fourths inch like thick MDF. This has half inch thick, right? And so it's not a terribly heavy speaker or a really overbuilt cabinet, although it does have three window braces, um, like dividing the cabinet up, which is pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. But so I thought, well, those might be due to the, okay, when you look at the uh, impedance and, and the uh, phase, electrical phase and the electrical impedance here, sometimes when you see ripples, like little, like uh, little ripples around, and we see them from like 200 hertz to like 500 hertz, like little ripples in this response it sometimes it sometimes it means those are like it's a resonating cabinet a resonating panel or something like the cabinet's like shaking a little bit right yeah and, it, and the cabinet's under damped but when i when i looked at the um the near field measurement of the uh, ports i noticed that those ripples actually hit the port resonances like not the, not the fundamental port resonance but like 
like upper harmonic resonances that aren't really, you know, aren't really intended to be there. So I think those like little res those ripples might be a product of the port resonances and not not the cabinet itself. So another thing that I noticed too is um, the impedance at high frequencies is down almost to four ohms. There, what that tells me is they're using a four ohm tweeter to increase the sensitivity of the system. Yeah, I mean it's not, it's it's a sensitive speaker. It's not super sensitive. It's this is not a terrible like impedance load. So you could any any AVR could really. Run it's it. really a six ohm speaker or closer to four ohm than eight ohm. Let's be honest. Yeah, but they're all, you know, there's nothing serious here that there's nothing that's going to tax any, you know, any semi decent amplifier, right? So, like, yeah, your AVR is going to run these speakers just fine. So, there's nothing here to really worry about. And I like that you show the impedance all the way down to 10 hertz because I've seen speakers that, um, if they don't put a crossover on the mid range and they run that full range, that's in parallel with the other woofers and at very low frequencies down to, to close to DC. You're looking at an extra woofer in parallel and you could get to an impedance below two ohms and that's what shuts off avrs yeah but but you have to keep in mind that hardly there's hardly any content that even you know goes down to 10 hertz so, or below that so you, know, you can have that and it's probably not going to be a problem unless you're playing some weird i've shut speaker. i've shut receivers off with speakers i did that though oh okay but, you know, All right. i play i play at different levels than you do yeah um, i suppose so um, next time you do these impedance plots, maybe if you could change the color of the uh, phase. Oh yeah, actually they are different colors, but yeah, I know double. it's. I could it's see double. it, but I could see people that may be colorblind being looking at that and like, what's what? But anyways, I'll see if but, I can do that in RW. Yeah, I think you can, or even make a dotted line. All right, so what are we looking at here now? Okay, so this is something that was really good and, and really surprised me at the speaker. So we, like large tower speakers with drivers that are spread apart, typically don't have a very wide range of like a vertical dispersion where you can listen on them and, it, and have the response not get really screwed up. But somehow this one does. Somehow like you don't have to be, have your ear dead on axis with the, like on the same level as a tweeter to get a good response. It holds response mm. like from from you know negative 10 degrees i would say all the way up to 15 degrees and it hardly changes the response at all so it has a really wide i mean a relatively wide like vertical dispersion so you don't have to like you can slouch and listen to these or you could be you know have a higher seating position and listen to these like say you're in a back row with an elevated seating position right you're, you're gonna hit, get hit with the same um sound character and so that's that's really unusual for a speaker where the drivers are separated by such a wide distance yeah, and you usually see a dip when you go 15 or plus or minus 15 degrees. You see a dip between the tweeter and the crossover of the, of the yeah. mid-range. You, know, you start to see it. You start to see that dip at negative 15 oh, degrees. Oh, shoot. I put the wrong one. Like, yeah, but it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. This is unusually good. This unusually is really good. good, yeah. Yeah, this is an excellent response. This is very surprising. I was very happy to see this. So that's that's really cool. That's really cool measurement, you know. So For I guess real. we so you know, I don't like like I've said before. I don't normally post near field measurements in my reviews because you know they they're so prone to misinterpretation, right? Yeah. But one thing um, I want to kind of draw your attention to is the mid range driver it has a really wide bandwidth here. If you can see, it's like kind of a light green line that that crosses that covers the entire mid range. The one with the peak at fifty hertz. Yeah. See that it it goes all the way down to fifty hertz. The mid range driver. It's almost so like a two and a half way system. That's exactly what I was going to say. This is almost like more like a two and a half wave system. And I wonder if that's what's helping that um, vertical dis dispersion consistency. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So yeah, you not, know why? Because it's almost acting like an MTM at that point, And you're you're averaging out the lobing uh, vertical and the vertical plane. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't I mean, That could be it. There, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why. I think also that you can see that the filters aren't really that steep, right? Yeah, but maybe it's the the shallow filters. Like maybe that's a second order at the most. You know, um, for, for high passes, impressive. pretty and low impressive. passes. Yeah, th I think that's one of the th ingredients that's helping the, the this speaker maintain such a wide vertical dispersion, and it it's working. So it's a really good lesson in how to get a really good um really good performance with not really expensive parts. You know, uh, like right. This, so we can kind of see what this is doing. So this is a slide that that. Uh, kind of shows you like okay the cabinet is not that's one of the parts of the speaker where they had to kind of cut costs right the cabinet yeah. isn't the most heavy duty but you know the good the good news about that is 
if you wanted to, to make it better, right? That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the easiest to do. Make it to make it better. Like I say, you can like you can add some more like like wood paneling into the inside. Maybe like glue it on there with some kind of a viscoelastic adhesive, like green glue, right? Would would really help dampen any you know ca cabinet resonances. And I don't think it's a big deal. That, I don't think that the the speaker is bad in, in like cabinet resonances with the paneling, right? But if you wanted to make it better, here's a few ideas that are, are inexpensive, re really cheap, easy to do to make this feel more like a, a high-end, you know, heavy-duty hi-fi loudspeaker. It's, it Just keep in mind, if you're going to do any modifications to the product, that most likely will avoid the warranty. It'll avoid the so, warranty, yes. Yeah, so, so we're not telling you you should go out and pull the speakers apart as when you get them yeah. and mod them. Yeah, exactly. But if you're a handy person or you know someone that's, in the speaker business that would come over your house and maybe make some tweaks. These are possible tweaks that you can make to deaden the sound of the cabinet. Cause that, like James was saying, that's the weak part of the speaker. That's where the budget had to be cut because they're putting a lot of performance into a speaker that's under 1600 bucks a pair. So these are some great suggestions and you could do these to a lot of different speakers. I mean, there's tons of speakers on the market that could use more deadening and these, this is good advice for not just the Heikos, but maybe some other speakers um, that we've reviewed in the past as well. So it's just something to consider, not something we're telling you you should go and do. Definitely not something that should deter you from buying the product. Yeah, don't think that the, the product, these are the things you can do just to make them feel a little bit heavier duty. Um, but like you said, Gene, don't, don't, you're breaking the warranty if you do any of that, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So like, don't 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 screw around with that too much if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Um. So this is what I wanted to ask you because people are going to ask us um, in the comments. How does this compare? We've reviewed the Polk R700. We reviewed the Monolith T6, and there the price is right in the middle of those two products. Yeah. It's how like, does this how does it, this compare? It's dead in the middle, and like it's exactly where it should be with respect to those two. Um, tower speakers. So they're two really high value tower speakers for their price point, right? And this is a very high value speaker for its price point, right? So it scales really well with those two speakers. I mean, if I were shopping for speakers in these price points, these are the speakers I'd get, you know, the, the T6s and the $800 price point, the Heikos and the 1600 and the Polk Reserves and like the 22 or 2300. I don't know what the prices is right now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But it's like, it's like, you get more speaker for your money and like, and uh, you know, here's a few points I, I, I put up to show how these actually compare. And um, they're, they're better than the T6s, not, ent not entirely better than the T6s, but mostly better. Not quite as good as the uh, R700s, but in some respects they are as good as the R700s and even in some respects they're a little bit better. So, you know, it depends on what you're really looking for, what you really want. And like, these are just, I uh, it's, this uh, uh, slide just kind of shows you how they compare with some speakers that we reviewed recently. It's definitely an interesting comparison because as James said, the Polk R700s, the Mono Price, Monolith, Encore T6s, and now the Heiko Aurora 1000s, these are all extremely high value, well-engineered products, but there's always compromises in, in, in products when you're not spending tens of thousands of dollars and and as you spend more money, you either get more output or you get better build quality or you get a combination of the both and usually more base extension as you spend more money as well. And I think that this succinctly shows you um, good, better, best, but they're all really good products within their respective price points. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all, we're really fortunate. I, I'm really fortunate that I've had these for, you know, review. These are like the last tower speakers I've had and they've all been really good. You know, I've, not every tower speaker I've, I've had has been all that great, right? Like recently, recently, it's just been a string of like knockout um, tower speakers I, I've had and like, I'll hopefully it continues, I doubt it will, but we'll see, you know, maybe I'll just keep getting lucky, you know? <laughs> well, we're just, trying to pick and choose what, people are interested in, but also we kind of pre-qualify a product before we bring it into review to make sure it, it will be a legitimately good product. So it's hard for us to get a really bad performer when we kind of study the product before we get it in. And that's deliberate to you guys. Cause I don't want to just have, waste James's time with garbage. Yeah. We, we do have a little bit of a selection, like a selectation bias going on. We don't, we, if we see something, we're not, 
we think might be kind of like it's not going to be that great, right? We're just gonna we're gonna pass on it, right? We're, we we want to show you guys the stuff that's really good rather than like just review something just to bash it, right? That's not what we do here. So yeah, yeah there's that to consider. Well, James, I appreciate you dropping the knowledge on the Heiko Aurora 1000 tower speakers. Like I said before, they're $7.99 each. They're available at Audio Advice. I'll put the links in the description down below. Check out our written review on audioholics.com. The link will be down there as well. And um, we'll, we'll have you back for another speaker review pretty soon. I'm sure you got a lot on your plate right now that you are readying. So... James, again, I appreciate all your testing. Guys, please thumb this video up, hit the subscribe button. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.